And great to see so many of you here. I used to come in this particular building and was frankly a rather mess on the road down. So it's wonderful to see now that this is such a beautiful uh, cafe now and uh, also inspiring even for uh, science. So I'm going to, in the next 15 minutes, uh, take you on a little tour of how to build planets and then after that we're going to find planets. Um, and uh, basically the message uh, that I'm going to give is the, the, the sort of bottom line of the message is that around well, every young star there is enough material to form a planetary system, a new planetary system. So the ingredients for planet formation are very common in the universe. Good. Right, so this is a question before the quiz <laughs> for the non-astronomy members of the audience. What is actually the difference between a star and a planet? Size. Size, size as well, yes. <laughs> That's more and more concrete. Uh, what does, why does size matter? <laughs> All right, maybe this gives you a hint. So uh, later we'll talk, uh, Vincent will talk about probably the Travis One system. So you see your seven planets. And you see the star, well, it's so size, yes, yeah, it's one, but uh, what does the star do? I'm not sure I hear, but let's go through some of the answers uh, here. So there are two, two differences between them. One is the formation scenario, how they are formed. And the one is from a collapsing cloud, as you saw in the first picture. And uh, I'll come back to that. Um, whereas the other one form in a rotating disk of uh, gas and dust around the young star, a so called, so -called protoplanetary disk. And the other big difference is that the star actually can do nuclear fusion, can burn hydrogen, um, and thereby heat itself uh, to more than uh, 10 million degrees, uh, whereas a planet definitely cannot burn hydrogen, it cannot even burn deuterium, which requires a somewhat lower temperature. And that a lot that has to do with the size, that's why size matters, whether or not it can uh, uh, ignite nuclear fusion. Um, so basically it needs to be around 10% of the mass of our sun in order to be massive enough to start burning hydrogen. And then that is when you have a star. Whereas a planet is less than, say, about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, the most massive planet in our own solar system. So those are two very important uh, differences, formation scenario and nuclear fusion. I'll talk now in the rest of primarily about the formation scenario. So, for our own solar system, just to remind you, our sun is a star and the planets are the ones that we see uh, uh, down here. So, the, uh, <laughs> the billion dollar question actually that we are trying to answer is how are we um, as we are here, and our, our little planet, Earth, planet Earth, how are we actually formed some four and a half billion years ago? And we get information from astronomical observations, but at the end I'll also come back to the information that we actually get from our own solar system. We have some messengers that tell us about you know, how our own solar system formed. We have meteorites that basically are the leftovers from uh, here from asteroids when they collide and break up and uh, fall to the Earth. That happens primarily in the inner solar system, like uh, where our Earth is. Uh, comets, on the other hand, are in the outer parts of our solar system. They contain a lot of ice and, and uh, rock, um, and uh, they are sort of probably the most primitive material that was present in our own forming solar system. And we've had an incredibly exciting uh, mission recently, the Rosetta mission, to such a comet uh, that has told us a lot about what is happening uh, there. So there are seven things. Okay, um, so we're going to build planets and we're going to look at where we're actually making them. So I assume you recognize this uh, constellation. <laughs> good, good. So um, here is the uh, hunter, uh, so this is his Churchill, and this is his sword, and here you see this little nebula, that is the Orion Nebula. And the Orion Nebula is actually a nursery of new stars 
and uh, planets. So you see a beautiful uh, um, image that was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope in optical light. So the light that we can actually see with our own uh, eyes. So you see these beautiful red nebula, but that is actually not the gas in, in which stars and planets form. That's very hot gas of 10,000 degrees um, that is not forming new stars. Where we are finding sort of the formation of new stars is here in these dark planes that you see here. And they are so dark, if you go to one of the next, if you can push them one more time, oops, oops. Sometimes it gets stuck a little bit. Yeah. Oops. So this should this should work. Ah, there we go. Oops. There we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> okay, good. So, um, what we see here is actually these dark uh, regions. Uh, this is the Carina Nebula. And they are so dark because they contain tiny, tiny uh, particles of, of dust. So, think a little bit like smoke. Uh, I used to be in this cafe when it was still about to smoke. You wouldn't be able to see the, the, back, of the, <laughs> the back of the room uh, because the, the little smoke particles basically absorb and scatter the light. The same on a smoky day. Uh, that actually you can uh, you don't see actually uh, very much there uh, in the sky, and so uh, but it is really here in these these dark regions uh, where new stars and new planets are being born, and these objects, these so-called clouds, these concentrations of the, the gas between the stars, are actually some of the largest objects that we have in our Milky Way. So they are some, maybe some hundred thousand times larger than our own solar system. They're up to several light years in the diameter. And they have enough material to maybe form a hundred thousand stars. They won't do that, um, but uh, they certainly have enough material to do so. Okay, so how do we make actually a star and a surrounding planet? Well, these, these star clouds that you see, they are stable for maybe a million years or 10 million years, but then at some stage, gravity basically wins, and the cloud starts to collapse under its own weight. And it will then form basically a protostar in the center, but then most of the cloud rotates a tiny, tiny little bit before a disk basically around the star. And it's in this disk, so this is really tiny on the scale compared with here, and this disk this is actually in which uh, uh, planets uh, can form. Now, we have a little problem, and this is why this field took so long to start going, uh, because these disks are tiny. So here is again our, uh, uh, our cloud, and uh, here is an artist's impression of such a rotating disk around a uh, young star. And if it were this big on the sky, then our previous generation of telescopes would have had no problems of seeing it. But it is not so big. It's actually tiny. It's very, very small. If you... Ah, there you go. <laughs> so, try to find a needle in a haystack. <laughs> you really need to point your telescope and uh, really zoom in there on these forming stars uh, uh, and the surrounding disks. And so we need to zoom in by about a factor of a thousand, and uh, that is what uh, the next generation of telescope has actually allowed us to do. Um, so one of my favorite telescopes uh, is, uh, also this is a uh, favorite telescope, and uh, Miguel's favorite telescope is uh, ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submitter so Array. It's uh, a fantastic uh, facility consisting of 54 12 meter dishes, uh, radio antennas basically uh, on a high site in uh, uh, northern Chile. Um, and it is the first, if you talk, talk a little bit about sociology rather than astronomy, it's also the first worldwide uh, collaboration in astronomy. So it's really both Europe, North America, and East Asia coming together to put this fantastic machine here in uh, northern uh, Chile. So that is also sort of an accomplishment of this particular uh, project. 
And it was also a project to bring it actually together. I mean, it's uh, all these components of all these telescopes, they had to come from across the world. Some of them were built in Japan and then delivered. I was in Europe, I was in North America, and they were all shipped to, uh, to Chile and then uh, driven here to this uh, location in northern Chile. And we are, we are here at the mid-level facility where the, sort of the telescopes were assembled. And once they were assembled and put together and tested, then they were put on this gigantic truck and uh, driven up the mountain until they came at the high side, basically at 5,000 meters, uh, where they were then put in the rain and so that we could uh, start observing with it. So this is also a uh, sort of testimony to the high tech technology to make that possible. So the facility was inaugurated in 2013, it was completed in 2014, and since that time we have been enjoying lots and lots of good data from it. And uh, several of us have been here at the site, and I can tell you it's uh, both literally and figuratively a uh, breathtaking experience <laughs> to be there at 5,000 meters. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then Craig didn't go to this telescope. <laughs> he would have liked it, but he was actually present at the, uh, uh, at the, the VLT, the, the large telescope, so it's uh, set up up now. And we enjoyed uh, seeing them and this group for about an hour or two in astronomy. So it was very interesting also hearing about astronomy. Good. Um, what have we gotten? Well, this is one of the beautiful images that has come, uh, that Alma has taken. It's basically an image of a disk in which, perhaps, at this very moment, a young disk around a, uh, around a star in which perhaps it is more than new planets are forming. And just to give you an idea of the size, this is now uh, the, the orbit of Neptune. So we're starting to really look now on the scales of our own solar system. And this is not the only image that has been taken, this is a recent collection of uh, a, a set of them, some of them here in the orbit of Neptune, some of them we're even starting to look on the scale of the orbit of our own Earth, so one astronomical unit of distance from the Sun to the Earth. Um, so again, we see here a, a, a gap that may be indicative of uh, planets, uh, planet formation. And we see these intriguing structures now appearing in, in these various images. What is actually happening there? Well, this is a little animation that uh, we start with these tiny dust grains, but uh, once they get in this disk, they actually collide with each other and they collide more and more frequent, and then they start to stick. Not all of the collisions will result in sticking, but a fair amount of them actually will, will go actually towards growing to larger and larger bodies. So we start as tiny micron-sized or sub-micron-sized particles, and we collide them and we make them bigger and bigger, as you see uh, over here, to first pebbles, um, and then even uh, planetesimals, comet-sized bodies, and eventually then onto planets. <laughs> So, very briefly, sort of this is the process that we think that happens, how it exactly happens, because we need to grow by 13 orders of magnitude, we don't know yet, but somehow nature has found a way, we are here, so that's proof that uh, it can work, uh, but exactly how it works we still don't understand. But once you have such a... Uh, um, uh, once you have such a uh, rotating disk with a larger body in it, then it can start to sort of act like a snow plow. It can sort of clear its orbit here, where it is. And even though we cannot see the young planet itself, we can sort of see the gap that it carves here in this, uh, in this uh, disk. And that is actually what we are observing in our observations, like you saw before, these gaps that we saw on these disks. So that's an indirect indication that planets are forming there at this very moment. So, in its simplest form, how are planets built? We start with these tiny grains, we bring them together in some way in these, uh, in these disks, the high densities that we have in these disks, the collisions. We form sort of these planetesimals, about kilometer-sized bodies, um, which are about the size of uh, comets. Um, then once they are this big, then gravity starts to take over, 
we can make these so-called planetary embryos. Now they're the size of about the moon, uh, or maybe the size of Mars. Um, you know how big Mars is compared to this, our Earth? <laughs> so about 20% or so. <laughs> then. Uh, and then uh, out of these Mars-sized bodies, then we can make uh, um, uh, a planet. Now, why are we coming back now finally to our own solar system? So you see that these are our important building blocks. But this is when gravity starts to take over and starts to do its work and, 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 and go eventually to, to something like an, uh, an Earth-like planet. And it's really thanks to these observations of comets that we have here in our own solar system that we're now starting to see these black hole building blocks. Um, this was a beautiful comet in 1995 that you could see with your own naked eye. And uh, many of you probably didn't see it yet. <laughs> but I remember that it was really gorgeous. Uh, but, uh, you, know, you could just see it uh, in full glory on the, on the night sky for a few weeks, and it was fantastic. Um, and now, of course, this, uh, the Rosetta mission, we've actually gone to a comet and we've really landed on it. And so we studied it in, uh, in great detail. And so, um, if you think of, if you look at this, this body here, so you can think of it, uh, I'm thinking here of <laughs> sort of making it, but you can see it already, it is it's right, uh, such a weird shape, actually, that uh, so we have. And so probably during one of its passages, it will start to break up really at the neck of the duck. And, uh, and break apart uh, in one of the, the next passages uh, uh, past the sun. Good, so this is where I want to end and uh, open up the floor for questions and just saying that uh, this is sort of the link in going from building planets to then actually finding them what you get in the next uh, talk. Thank you very much.